Hi, I thought I'd share a little bit today about a little known um, difference called um, synesthesia and what what I um, have experienced in my life in it's um, it's a trait I've had since I was born um, but became kind of uh, probably more inner I was more <clears throat> it it was evident more as I was uh, entering school and learning numbers and things like that um, I have been diagnosed with dyscalculia which is a it's an it's a I think in my family it's a genetic trait so many things are genetic in my family it's like many members of my family have these things but um it affects math and um math concepts uh m math perception number perception time so like i couldn't tell time by a clock until I was nine. My father would uh, take me for long walks from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, Saturday and Sunday every, every every good day of the year uh, if it was warm enough and taught me how to tell time by the sun which made a lot more sense to me. Um, but the synesthesia affected my dyscalculia. So even though numbers were hard for me, hard concepts, the majority of, of the reason in, I don't know, in the beginning, I would have had a tr trouble either way, but in the beginning was because the synesthesia is something that makes your senses or your perception of things um, be affected in a different way. So some people, and, and I hear this more typically, is that they hear sounds as music, musical notes, um, <clears throat> or, or, or see colors as musical notes. Um, I smell in high or low which would equate to musical notes but I don't hear any music it's it's just high or low so the smells are high or low that's been a, a big aid to me in cooking because I can take any smell which you smell your seasonings um, you can't even taste them unless you can smell them so I smell them and they have an, a, a ranking note, either low or high, middle, somewhere in that, in that bar. And according to what they are, I could take another spice and, and create a balance. So if I have a spice here, then I'll want a spice here. And that's something synesthesia is like very spatial. We even though we have spatial problems, <laughs> knock things down because of other, you know, coexisting traits. Um, I've been nicknamed the bull in the china shop, but um, but that having those notes like ha ha helps me to create the the balance for the recipe and. Um, I forgot what I was saying, so I have to kind of ad lib. Um, <clears throat> the synesthesia affects my numbers. So, as a child, absolutely everything was either male or female. It, it, it was almost as if it told me what it was. It wasn't the thing telling me, it was just my way of form like the way it's 
identity, <laughs> even though it's not a living thing, um, had a, a formula and would tell me what it is. It also, like, in placing things with the um, spatial awareness, because with synesthesia gave me the ability to, like, have a middle point and be able to place objects, like, so exactly um, apart from that middle point, so, so they they were equal, um, and the fact that it was telling me where it belonged, <laughs> on account of, it was all, it was all weights and balances in, in a virtual sense, so if I placed a cup on the dinner table, it had a value of volume, weight, height, <laughs> width, um, and then to place the forks so the plate would take up more space. So I would balance the space um, where I placed the cup, um, you know, the, the, the utensils being either they were uh, more than one together or single that all came into play and how far away from the edge because I will be measuring you know very quickly like in split seconds the distance across the table where the other plates are or were going to be placed and it, it, it sounds like OCD but uh, the difference between OCD is that OCD doesn't release you. <laughs> um, this is not like a bondage. It is just a world that I lived in and it was all about my perception. And while, while I had dyscalculia and couldn't do numbers the way other people could do them, I still had numeric values. To, my world was just built in numeric values. And, um, but I didn't have numbers attached to them. It was just space. Uh, and <clears throat> like, for example, setting the table, I'm going to get back to the, the, what my numbers were like, but for example, setting the table, the knife was, they all have, every object has an identity. It, it it was male, it was female, it had a personality, it had a value, a, a numeric type value. And so like the knife was a bully. It was not nice to the girl who was a spoon and the fork who was um, a handsome young man or her brother sometimes. And um, he kept trying to harm the spoon so I had to keep them apart so the knife <laughs> despite the rules of setting the table knife had to go alone and fork had to be between knife and spoon all the time um sp spoon wasn't a weak but she was a virtuous female and um knife was always trying to exploit and um violate like violate her boundaries or violate her her virtues so <clears throat> a plate was basically like a mother and the table was just like um a little non-gender kind of more male you know a little non-gender um and everything had to be placed specifically. So some people might see their kids doing things like this and think they are OCD, when in fact it could be they are interacting with their spatial perception, they're, they're involved in their spatial perceptions of um, synesthesia. And, okay, so then my numbers, like, one, for example, he has two colors, but he's one or the other at any given time. So usually, usually red. Two is yellow, 
four is green, three is red, five is blue, um, seven is green, and, and these numbers have stayed these colors my whole life. Um, as I've gotten older, they have acquired secondary colors, which are typically yellow or white, um, and sometimes red. They lay in a vertical line for me from left to right up to 20. And after 20, they go backwards from 21 to 30 and so on, 90 to 100. But after 100, they continue out for like ever and ever, just forever, Un inconceivable. You can't visualize anymore. And they're at a slant, so they're, from your perspective, they're going left to right, left to right, left to right, left to right, and then out at this slant. This In school, this makes it very hard for me to understand the way that people lay out the numbers, you know, to add and subtract when one has the highest value of any number in my world. Um, it's, it's the one that basically has the final say to anything over the others, and I really don't know what they talk about, <laughs> if they do at all, but what I'm saying is, when you're trying to add one and one equals two, no it doesn't, one and one equals infinity. So, how am I supposed to sit in class and understand what it is people are telling me? Um, 10 is lower than a 7. so And it doesn't like go down from 1 because a 5 has a higher value than a 7. But, low, you know, it's like, it's, everything would weigh. So when I kind of like began to learn, like after many decades, I learned math, what the values in everybody else's world was in math, I was able to weigh their numbers. And at like 28 years old, I'd have a $100 bill, I would go shopping, and I would look at the price, but I had no ability to... Um, like I could add a I could add maybe up to like four lines of numbers, three lines usually. I had like a sec I still do have a second or third graph grade math level with a few skills in sixth, but maybe like comprehension mostly, not in application. So so I would go into the grocery store, I would look at the look at the price and weigh it, weigh it. <clears throat> I really don't know how I did it I just it would weigh to me it would have a feeling that would weigh a certain amount and then I would place it into the buggy and keep shopping and you know long story short when I would cash out at the register I would hand her a hundred dollars and she would give me a penny back all by weighing and there's a synesthesia has um, some other aspects to it is in our abilities. And one of mine is that I can take two eggs, hold one in each hand. Sometimes I might have to switch hands, but I can take the same two, two eggs out of the same package weigh it in my hands and tell you which one is heavier, then put them on a scale, compare it, and I will be right. Or if I hang a picture, I can hang it without any tool, any um, leveling tools, and it will be perfect. Um, that's w what also is like if I see objects on surfaces like pictures or vase or flowers or books or anything really um, 
they'll start telling me where where they need to be or like I'm out of balance and I have to I don't have to but I'm very strongly inclined to go and correct it um, to create the balance or when I'm placing them I always place them in perfect balance um, so it was a point I was trying to make on that it's hard because people with very complex thinking um, traits lose our thoughts frequently. We sound like we're stupid, but the reason why we lose our thoughts is because we just got so much going on in there. And, um, oh, okay, so talking about the synesthesia and, and the weighing of, of eggs, um, one time I was with my children in the museum and they had uh, in the children's uh, they had this like table laid out of different things and there were these little stainless steel weights with little handles on top of them and they were all jumbled and the object of that game was to um, put them all in order uh, according to their weight now they were all the same exact size so they didn't get smaller they didn't have numbers of identification um, they did have numbers of identification on them but not according to their value so um, so you couldn't put them in any order and be right by according to the numbers they had um, you would have to like look at the answer sheet chart to know if you put them in the right order and all the numbers that corresponded to the weights would not be in uh, chronological numeric order so um i j just winged it sat there and did it one piece was missing cause somebody walked off with it and it's interesting because somebody gave me um a bunch of sewing stuff and in the sewing notion and materials there was one of those little weights in there and i was like maybe that's the piece that's missing it was in the same city <laughs> i just wonder who they walked off with it um i think they used it to like weight their cloth so when they sewed it wouldn't move around when they're cutting it or something but i don't know i never knew if it was the same piece but my answers were all 100 percent correct and like with colors I'm beginning to lose my um, color perception so my white no longer looks and this is just as physio physio physical it's not uh, has anything to do with brain anything it's um, actually something physical happening to me but I'm losing my color so I can't I'm not a, a I can't tell what is what some colors are exactly anymore but I can still see their values and I can still tell someone what what color is uh, lighter or darker and be extremely accurate um, and it has also helped me in art because in art in the real world like pavement people always paint it gray in you know like not not artists but like say kids in school or people aspiring they'll paint to street gray and in actuality it's often periwinkle um, a slate blue sometimes like a smoky smoky um it's got a tinge of green in it, like a smoky greenish brown. It's a mocha. It's pavement really is never just in the grayscale. Um, and the same thing with leaves. So we might sometimes when you're looking at art and you're like, why does it look so colorful? That's because someone who's able to see those colors when they're when they're creating that art. Um, exaggerated them whether they realized it or not but they perceived them and so um, 
and, and, and like, so say if I cutting paper along the edge, I can cut it extremely, extremely exact. Um, I can cut things off in the same length, or I can look at an object and not have to measure it. I can go and uh, find the piece of, a piece of something that I need that fits it, and it will fit. Um, so when my dad would take me for those walks and teach me the sun, I, like the synesthesia really helped with that because I, I could tell anywhere in the sky, like what time it is and be accurate within 10 minutes. Like 10 minutes was my greatest off, <laughs> but most of the time I was right on the dot. And I think it also helped with, well, they used to call me eagle eye because I would notice things. I'm, I notice things. I don't have very good vision anymore, but I still will notice things other people don't notice. Um, I think the autism helps me also know, noticing sounds, noticing things, um, visual things. So, like, I, I, I would be walking, holding my hand, my dad's hand, on the sidewalk downtown, and just getting into the car parked on the side of the street, I mean, out of the corner of my eye, I would notice, and there would be a $20 bill down in the drain. And that would that would be life over for him. He'd have to be figuring out how to get me that twenty dollars because that's the way I, I like. Um, I don't know. If, I don't know how to express it, but like forged forward in life for myself, very aspiring person, uh, an I can thinker. Like I didn't need that movie. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yes, man. You know, I didn't need. I, I was always I can raised that I can you know and to try to like help myself before I ask for help um, many times help myself before I ask for help so uh, I couldn't I really understand I wasn't like a pushy kid I just couldn't understand it's $20 bills is like only that far down so we can get this we can we can find a way to get this and um, Sure enough, you know, he, he came up with ways he had some um, Wire and um, Piece of gum and we we weighted it with the uh, a coin and stuck it to the wire and dropped it down so it would and <laughs> pull it up but like I was finding money all the time all the time and like pe people lost money because now that doesn't happen but um we we've had our experiences with finding money boy oh boy like a hundred dollars in one shot and it was just just money blowing around under our car <laughs> so but anyway, um, I, I absolutely love my synesthesia. I, I don't have any deficits from it. It's, it, it, it has coexisted with my other traits like um, autism, dyscalculia, um, I think dyslexia to some degree. I would say I, I don't like my dyslexia, but... Um, I think I think having dyscalculia helped me to be like to not override my synesthesia and grow out of it and the other things like synesthesia do that I I do also is um, a lot of a lot of people with an, uh, synesthesia see um, images in things so like when I would lay on my bed as a kid and anytime I have that type of ceiling it's called popcorn ceiling it's a it's a treatment they do and it leaves like these little foamy bumps all over and sometimes it has sparkles 
and I would lay there and it would seem like it was just kind of moving and moving and but and then just repeating and moving and moving I would see images in them sometimes I don't like the images sometimes it'll look like a mean face or a scary bear or something um, I see I see those images in tree bark and when I look at carpeting uh, or grass like the carpeting or grass will ripple it 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 looks like it's moving along and then repeat moving along and repeat um, one one thing I always had issues and picked up and noticed with bathroom doors the ones made out of wood that are stained and I got to question this because I've noticed it since I was a little kid it's like they do this on purpose when they cut that wood and they put those two pieces together to form the image or like the design or the pattern it always looks like a human form it's always like a head and shoulders and an hourglass figure and a woman's sort of body and I'm like that why does it always have to be some kind of like woman's naked body on the on the door like uh, sometimes I just don't want to see that what I've noticed about, um, and I did a video on this, I, I'm not sure where I've placed that video, if, if it's still, I might have like lost it or put it somewhere, but uh, like I might have left it on Facebook and when I I don't have Facebook and other social medias anymore, but um, when I look at, a spe it's the linoleum tiling there are always you could look at it but I, I had showed examples in that other video is every every image I will I will see faces and animals so it'll be dogs rabbits bears um, sometimes birds but not often and people um, and there's always the the people always have some sort of like a arrow nose it comes straight down and then it goes out and then it goes like this and it could be like really distorted or it could be pretty like almost you can't tell but it's always an arrow and the same thing with the with the animals like so if it's the if it's like i happen to see a lion or or a dog like it comes down and then it's always the nose if it's the rabbit there's always they have these arrows in there and I'm I start thinking to myself you know what um, I can't deny these images because it doesn't matter what company I go I what what brand what um, time period or like it could be 80s, 90s, 2000s, I still see clearly uh, the same types of animals, mainly, you know, it's, it's people, but mainly um, dogs, horses, um, bunnies, and then the lesser ones are like cats, birds, or something kind of rare but what I'm thinking is, is they probably just have these images like photo images and distort them for pattern sake and throw them in there and the only thing that could be sinister about this is if like elites or something are doing this to like put thoughts <laughs> in people's heads they have enough money to run these major companies somebody like that uh, or they think they're being clever and you know p pulling tricks on people or for fun for the, their own entertainment I really don't know but it's so consistent and it's so the same all the time and I'm, I can't figure out how come other people don't notice it as much as I do but when I point it out to them they start saying yeah that's true look at that you know and they'll look at other uh, older older linoleum and see it and it's um 
go ahead and check it yourself because there it is you'll see it um <clears throat> so yeah it's just those arrow noses and <laughs> and those certain types of images you know regular types of images um <clears throat> it could be like <clears throat> excuse me a bouquet or any kind of thing you know might see um a face and a flower like the petals begin to look like hair or facial features or sometimes um, the shape of something will look like a swing so you know we go past those um, when we were in the 70s we go we would drive down these long roads they weren't like today they were long empty roads and there would be the oil rigs that are pumping the oil um, I forget what they're called but they will pump the oil and um, you see a lot of them and they always my brother kind of more ha had it too but he more like imagined it as dinosaurs which I I could see the dinosaur but they look like grasshoppers to me um, and, and lots of things like that so something as simple as a saddle on a horse can look can look like something completely different or um it's just many it's just many many things and and it makes us question why things are a certain shape why why were they shaped in such a way that they now um resemble this or that and and that's sometimes distracting. So when your synesthesia kid is in school and dealing with their their trait, not like a um, defect, it's a, it's a beautiful trait. Um, you know, th their minds are, are just so much input going into the mind. And, and then people go say, well, they have ADHD. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. But did you ever question, do they have synesthesia? Ask your kids some questions. What, like, watch, watch what they're doing around the house. Are they consistently placing things, consistently moving things? Are they very precision-oriented? Um, you know, do they seem to have some kind of um, intellectual, spatial... Thing going on um, when you show them a book with an animal like say like an encyclopedia page and it's got an animal uh, do you find it odd that they are noticing a leaf more than what you're trying to bring to their attention you know um, there's a plant called the poly uh, and I I call it the alligator plant because it looks like an alligator. Um, it doesn't, I don't know what Polly looks like, but like maybe like a parrot. <laughs> I don't know. That's pretty typical, right? Um, I don't even think a parrot looks like a Polly. And he looks like a basket of fruit to me because he's all kinds of colors, unless he's blue. You know, and and the thing with synesthesia too is we're gonna notice shapes in animals. Like for me, I especially notice how um, rhino. They they have two different lip styles, but I love the lip style that goes wide, and I love the two horns, and I love. I love the slope of their heads. It's the slope. It's in wide slope. It's beautiful. I don't know what to compare it to. You know, the ears. Oh gosh, them and those and zebras. They have those cone-shaped ears that are so tightly coned at the bottom, and so they have this beautiful petal leaf like like if you took the leaf off of a tulip and turned it upside down oh it's I don't know it's got like 
so much more beauty to me than a waterfall. Like, I find the rhinoceros so much more beautiful. And, and the zebra, they have these big round haunches, and I love round shapes, and they're so, like, it's got to be like a round button, um, like the old-fashioned 1950s, 60s, and 70s lipstick samples, where they were like in these little bubbles that were sort of rounded but and smooth but flattish on top, and they had a little peel-off. Thing and you're supposed to apply the lipstick. Ah, oh, those little buttons were like the but the eyes on a raggedy Ann, the old fashioned raggedy Ann, not the hand sewn ones, the manufactured ones. Those eyes are so beautiful, like cute, cute, cute little shape. Um, oh, yeah, anyway, um, that and and the zebra and it's just funny like I, I come to I come to learn things about um, these type of animals too that endears them to me all the more like the loyalty that uh, um, rhinoceros has and and the cheetah I always love the cheetah spots more than the leopard um, uh, I loved their hair was mixed more of the tawny and the white intermixed a softer look with longer and shorter hairs and um their faces were just sweet but i also love that they could run fast and as a kid that's what i always wanted to do um but i i learned that the mother uh if one of her babies is lost eaten or stolen like she will almost die and possibly really die because her loneliness and her loyalty to that to that kitten despite having other kittens is so great that her depression is so severe um, when she loses that she can't even eat and it causes her to lose the milk and she can't feed the others because she can't help mourning she can't help feeling so, so broken over the loss. And like, I wish human beings felt like that over their kids. We have a lot to learn from animals. But yeah, oh, there's a whole lot of other things. Synesthesia is good. Okay, here's, now some people might say, well, that's that's the autistic thing. But it's also um, an, an anesthesia thing is, I will notice the tiniest grain of anything in my shoe. I might even have a hard time finding it in my shoe. But if I keep looking, I eventually get it. Or I'll I'll go take tape and stick it in around my hand and then put it in there and pat, 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 get it out. It'll be something. I call myself <laughs> the princess and the pea because it'll drive me insane. You know, I can feel it. I, I can feel a hair. No one else can feel like a, a hair land on my hand, <laughs> on my arm, or uh, just super, super sensitive, su super aware, super in tune with the world. Um, I think one, too, one of the things that my synesthesia did, which was, I kind of thought was, autistic my whole life but really it was uh, the synesthesia was the smells I can smell everything I think that's where synesthesia kind of balances my autism where smells smells often with autistic people will annoy them it'll be too strong too powerful or whatever where where the synesthesia balances it out because the smell is a note and it it helps me do things and i was probably like a wolf or a coyote or some kind of canine like a hound because from the time i was a baby i remember being an infant and like you know just moving my hands around and and then my my clothing would come across my nose and i would smell it and i would love that i used to they used to scent the tissues from the tissue box 
and the toilet paper back in the day. They don't anymore. And I would run around with that tissue in my hand, just smelling it all the time. But my sense of smell being so keen, um, like I can smell when things are plugged in. People will say that they can't, but I've I've heard of people who who do say they could smell electricity. It's not it's not the plastic, it's not the metal. It's it's a different sort of a scent that only happens when something is plugged in and turned on um, and it doesn't matter what sort of a thing it is and they don't always have the same materials but it's the smell of electricity um, and, and rain like I'm sensitive to the smell of when rain falls and I didn't know why that's because there's a chemical chemical released from the cement when it rains and that kind of affects my my respiratory but from from smelling every single thing in the universe that I could get close enough to smell since I was tiny um, from the floor like I can still remember what the varnish on the floor smells like I can remember what fresh smell fresh wood um, what um, um, fiberglass tiles smell like uh, carpeting padding um, and all the smells that come onto the carpeting from people walking on it and and couches like <laughs> there's no words to describe all this different varieties of scent of couch and and people and when I would go to the bank with my mom it was pretty old bank and back in the day it, it all the wood had turned from like oak color to like this really dark dark chocolate brown from age but I could smell everything I like I was just overwhelmed not overwhelmed but blasted is the right word blasted with smells from money uh, all the varieties of colognes the brass I could smell the what I smell brass I know what brass smells like from car, car uh, copper from silver from gold like I can smell the metals and so as a kid just running around the house running around town running at the park like running at school I, I smelled everything I smelled my desks my pencils um, my books like it wasn't just the smell like that's sitting there and the teacher places the paper on your desk and you smell fresh paper it was the ink, the paper, what kind of paper it was different than another kind of paper. And I would literally smell it, find a way to inconspicuously smell the paper. And sometimes it'd just be like I'm putting my head down, I'm looking, and I'm waiting for no one to be noticing and give that a smell. <laughs> but every time I did, because I have this, it's not as prominent now and I'm old, but uh, in my youth, I had um, a very high um, little um, cupid, cupid bow, and it stuck out. It would just touch everything, so it became like the little feeling finger, so I know what all the kinds of paper feels like. I know what every kind of bark, every kind of leaf, every kind of grass, um, bugs. I know what crickets feel like. I know what, because um, I catch them and I would feel them and smell them. I know what the different bugs smell like. I know what dragonflies feel and smell like, crickets, uh, butterflies, ladybugs, one beetle from another. I know what, um, I know what roly polies, like I just gotta feel them, smell them. Like it was right there, it was so close to each other. Like this is a great combination of what I'm, of acquiring some, information some data and I know all kinds of smells and I'm still like in, in gaining knowledge of smells I smell everything so when I'm in the house and I notice something I notice the smell sometimes I have to stop around and look around and think what's new in the house what came in it could be something really really inconspicuous you know a paper bag or 
something but that paper bag will also have like what grocery store it was in that the smell of that place and then I'll smell that and that'll be like it'll be something and every food every material like polyesters like you think it's polyester but sometimes it's nylon and they have different smells um i smell also factory like the place the place the, the, the garment was made and long after it's not been there <laughs> um i have toilet paper and i know it comes from china um i didn't know that when i first smelled i smelled um the Chinese like to burn an, an incense in a corner of their shops and their factories or wherever. They, they, they have it on them in their clothing from their homes and when they go to work or do anything. It's always burning. They burn to their gods and to their deceased. Um, but um, when I got the toilet paper, I instantly smelled that very typical uh incense that they use and i knew and so i looked at the at the bag and I'm like yep come from china <laughs> so uh it's like if i go into a craft store the first thing i'm i'm hit with is a, a tr like if i have to say i have one major sense my major sense is my sense of smell and after that it's it's Probably my feeling and then my eyesight. Um, I'm really good at hearing sounds, but my I've had um, at age five. See, everything changed at age five when they took my tonsils out. So I got a... Uh, they took my tonsils out. I lost my immediate recall of photographic memory. I still have photographic memory, but now after a few... Um, few later uh, traumatic br brain injuries I I have very damaged short-term memory um, I still remember everything I remembered before the surgery um, but everything after surgery I, I, I really kind of need a trigger sometimes it'll just come up by itself but to try to call something back, I need a trigger. Once I get that trigger, but I could tell you everything. I can, I could re pull it all back. But um, so I had the photographic memories, like in extremely keen hearing. I had better than 2020 vision. Um, my my dad was marvelled at me because he taught me to play chess and checkers at like four four and five years old. I think I started late four. Uh, and it was in Long Island, New York, where I learned what the, like, what all these smells of animals, turtles, frogs, like everything, caterpillars, bark, but, um, I got good at it, and I was beating him, and he would brag to his friends at the Coast Guard station, and they wouldn't believe him, so he actually brought me to work one day and let me play one of, I guess it was his, I'm assuming it was one of his friends who probably teased him the most. Um, but he let me play that guy and I beat him and like they were just both shaking their heads and la and my dad was grinning from ear to ear. <clears throat> um, but after the surgery, uh, I, I had difficulty after that. My, uh, they always played a memory game because they just like watching me do it. They like seeing how good I was. Initially, when they first taught me the game, the game was kind of, it was just getting to understand the game. And it, it was only like a few tries before I was able to match these cards up. But, um... I was going to say, yeah, and it, and it began to taper off <clears throat> after surgery, so I pretty much blame that surgery. Uh, they, There's arguments that, and there was questions in at first that anesthesia was causing problems with kids, but because 
scientists wouldn't look at the fact that kids were actually having problems after surgery. They were looking at, can we prove this scientifically? Um, they deny it, but I am a product <laughs> and I'll speak for those people who've had problems. I'm one of the reason why I have also photographic memory and I think I think this has a lot to do with the reason why people don't have photographic. And that is because when the mother is giving birth, there's a chemical that um, washes the baby so that there's a lot of chemicals that wash the baby, but this particular one, what it does is um, it, it calms, relaxes, and um, blocks the memory so that the baby, uh, and it works for the mom too, but it, it causes the mom not to remember how bad the pain is. It causes the baby to not be stressed during the birth, to relax, to soften, limp, and be able to squeak, you know, be pushed out with, because if the baby's all tight and rigid, it can't come out. If it panics, it's going to stiffen up. So it has to relax, and that chemical makes makes the brain not able to remember. That's why people don't remember their birth. But if you have a genetic type like myself, these are the people who wake up during surgery. So in, tons, in getting my tonsils out, I did wake up in surgery um, and in the recovery room too soon, like painfully too soon. <laughs> um and have had problems with dental anesthesia. So anest certain anesthesias don't work for me. Um, and that particular chemical from my mom probably didn't work for her very well and it didn't work for me. So when women have particularly painful births, that is um, often because you don't have that chemical working properly. And if you are on the strong end of that, genetic type um you will you will or your child will have um photographic memory so i do remember being born i can remember pre being born but i don't want to start an argument with anybody i do remember being in the womb um i don't have memories from every single day of it but i have particular memories from it and um they were verified not only by my mom um, but by myself too when like experiencing things with my mother and and also in infancy so along with the smells because I smelling started for me as an infant in my crib I can I still remember the texture of my my sheet um, especially because of the spit up and I was a um, formula baby so the spit up and then it would dry and sour a little bit and it would have that smell and this little like texture and because the sheets were flannel there would be little like bumpy pill sort of things from it being washed the way flannel turns and um and the type of pajamas that my mom the 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 pajama my mom would put on me it would have those covers that fold over like so um, on the hands, but she always kept those back because she kept my nails trimmed. But um, the feet, she would tie, the, the bottom was a sack and she would tie, it had a drawstring and she would tie it. And I never liked it because my toe would get stuck, my big toe would get stuck in the hole and I it would just sit on me and bother me and I couldn't get my toe out of it. And um, I didn't know how to kick off, kick it off. And then when I would scoot, so I would draw my legs up underneath my my belly and try to scoot forward. It stopped me from scooting, which is bad for a baby's development. But it also began to bear down on my shoulders more and more and more on my back, on my neck, pulling the... Um, the collar and the shoulder part of the material down on me so hard that I, I was in excruciating achy pain, achy, achy pain, and that would lead to crying. So I keep looking at myself down there, but um, I, I can tell you what, how the house was laid out as an infant. 
and how um, in the time like when my mom and dad, this is going a little deeper, when my mom and dad were sitting on their tweed, um, it was like a, a light olive amber, it was a combination of the popular colors but it wasn't one or the other it was you could only see the colors if you were close but it was woven in such a way that it would be a, a light olive amber and tweed couch boxy shaped couch and the couch sat facing their wall of their bedroom and on this side of the wall would be their um their sound system back then like their record player and the speaker it was a it was a unit and um it had the legs at an angle uh to the to this side there was a big bookcase on the wall the clock was above uh on that wall on my mom's bedroom and then the their bedroom door was right right alongside i mean you could see it straight straight from the couch at, an, at the left angle and um, she had me in her arms in the stacky pajama but it was left open I had on it, it was um, well there was different times one time it was white it was a white um, sacky pajama with little yellow flowers on it um, and then another time I had a white one with du with yellow duckies too, little tiny duckies and then I had, they were, they were all the, the colors, but for some reason my mom liked yellow most. I had pink, blue, green, um, I didn't have purple. Pink, yellow, blue, and green. And, um, but this day I was, I was wearing the yellow and, and, um, I had the white, so or the, not the yellow. This day I was wearing the white one with the little yellow flowers. I'm going to. And she had these ultra fuzzy socks that are so ultra fuzzy, like not like anything made today. They must have been made out of silk. Um, I, I had found one when I had my first child. I found one pair, one, in a um, store called McCrory's way back in the day, in the, in the early 80s. And I, gra I grabbed them for her. I couldn't find another one like it. Um, but they were just like mine. And I, that's why I latched on. I was like, these are, these are it's how I am. Like, that's the, the sock I used to have. So anyways, um, my little legs were dangling. So like she had her, her arm resting like so. And I was in her arm. See how tiny I was? I was an eight and a half pound baby when I was born. But my legs were resting over her hand and dangling. It felt really good when they were dangling. And as she would laugh and talk with her, with her husband, my dad, um, I, I would. She would jiggle, and it was rocking me to sleep. And I said, I cannot, cannot fall asleep, or she'll put me down. It was put me down because that's the words she always used. I'm gonna go put her down. So I was laying there in her arms and just loving the sound of her voice and my dad at the distance. I loved his voice at the distance, but I didn't like it up close. Um, he, so uh, I said to myself, I can't fall asleep in baby language. And little by little i was i couldn't help it and my eyes closed but i was awake in my mind and i said it's okay my eyes are closed but i'm not asleep so she won't put me down because i'm not asleep and then i heard her say she's asleep i'm gonna go put her down <sighs> the crushing angry pain i felt and can still feel to this day so mad I wasn't asleep. It just felt good. Why couldn't I stay there with them? I wanted to stay there with them and continue to feel that good feeling of just being able to relax in my mom's arm, to be able to fully relax. And here she took it away. And 
I felt like neither one of them wanted me and I kept thinking they just don't want me that was my exact thinking they just don't want me and I was getting ready to scream I was stiffening up and I was balling up into a ball with my stomach muscles this is all happening to me automatically I wasn't making myself do it it was like this is what transforming me into <laughs> a screaming baby where I couldn't scream though because my lungs were so full of air and locked the air was locked in but every muscle in my body was contorting like like uh like getting ready for a convulsion like just oh so angry and hurt so deeply deeply I can't even tell you the feeling of the extent of the deep feeling of hurt is not like anything any rejection I've ever felt in my life it's it was just absolutely shattering feeling and getting getting myself like my self reaction was happening to me and I but I was going I was with it not against it and I was thinking in my mind I'm going to give her the worst one I kept thinking that I'm going to give her the worst one what what's the worst a scream I'm going to give her the worst scream I've ever given her <laughs> that's what that's what I meant and she got into the bedroom door and laid me down on my face still all stuck in my little I was still stuck I couldn't even straighten my legs. They, I wanted to. I wanted to because I wanted to get up, get my head up and look at her like to say, come back or please don't. Like that was my feelings. I didn't have those words. But I was so stuck. And that made me hurt more, angry more, hurt more because I couldn't react the way I wanted to. My body was now against me. And... I finally was like able to start to move a little and screamed but as I was doing so and this is all like in seconds it's not like in minutes I I, I the door the door was shut open just a little crack that I could see the light was shining the way she always did it on my bed on kind of to my right right here or my left and and I screamed and cried and cried and cried and cried myself to sleep when a baby cries himself to sleep they cry with the feeling of rejection they feel god it hurts so bad <laughs> it still hurts so very bad I don't want to cry because I put my makeup on today. I, but honestly, like, it's a, it just takes your words away. It just, um, mothers don't know. I and for that reason, like, I was always so sensitive. I was always like try to let my baby, like, stay in my arms. But then I remember the times where like my arms would ache real bad, and I'd have to put them down and I know they would feel that way and it would crush me and then they would scream and then the pain and the triggering memory of how bad it hurt was like more that I could deal with you know and I think subconsciously everybody sort of remembers those emotions even if they can't remember the visual experience um and we all have to go through that feeling of being put away, you know, being put aside. But if you happen to remember, like I do, so vividly, it, it's, uh, it can become like, for me, it's become a lifelong hurt so that I'm, I'm really sensitive to the rejections. And while you wonder, why, why, why do people have these sort of rejection issues with others? Well, maybe they have more connection to their experiences in infancy than, than you do. <laughs>
than he or she does. So uh, maybe they have just a little more of that genetic trait than everybody, but not maybe not enough to actually make them remember what happened, what made them feel like that in the beginning. So I was always extra sensitive to my children's feelings. And so I had to escape for a second because I, I forgot my chicken and almost burnt it in the oven. Um, and then while I was checking that, I started remembering that I forgot to, to say, you know, that um, because I had the ear, nose, throat, and lung infections so bad when I was a kid, that was more have to do with the, the autistic genetics um, and then needed the surgery. Uh, after the surgery, I, I had, I, I was beginning to get tinnitus. Um, so I'm kind of like going off track a little bit right now. Sorry, I just like dumped you off the cliff with emotions, but uh, I can't really remember now where I was at with the other subject. So um, the tinnit, the, the people call it tinnitus, tinnitus, uh, so it started with whistling, my ears whistling. I would get like a, a whistle and then I noticed, okay, I could tap on the table. This is about age five. It was age five. I could tap on the table and if I kept tapping, eventually the whistle would stop. Um, and sometimes, because I had had dental fillings, so I had uh, that anesthesia pretty uh, they gave me laughing gas for that one and I think that also might have been that might have been they were close together so it was one or the other because it kind of kind of happened gradually but um I started having like the radio waves in my teeth and I would feel like the metal work the, the cavity uh, the fillings um vibrating and that kind of got me to going like and putting my molars together. They're not the same molars anymore, so I can't do it anymore once the adult ones came in. But when I had the child teeth and they matched up a certain way, I, I could just barely touch them together and use my voice to make a vibrating sound. And it was extremely soothing. And that was an autistic thing. Um... The autistic stuff was all spinning. Oh my gosh. Like, go to the laundromat with my grandmother and I would I would have to have my face. Like they kept getting mad at me because I wanted to stick my face over the over the um being asked to be picked up so I could stick my face over the the washer. But I discovered that the dryer was equally, but I had to wait for that. <laughs> Um, and it was a, it was a bowed in glass, so I could really like stick my face in there and just focus toward the back and blur my eyes. And then the tumbling would go and it was the most unbelievably satisfying, addicting feeling in the whole world. Or I would be turning my bike or the big wheels upside down and spinning the wheels, try to get my face as close. I got my face scratched by the big wheels wheel and I got my face hit by, because the pedal is on the wheel. <laughs> the pedal's on the wheel. You know, or I would get in lots of trouble for just sitting there and paddling a wheel and making it spin so I could like, uh, yeah. I was bad for um, the synesthesia and the um, autism came together. It looked like OCD, but it wasn't OCD where I couldn't. It started with the kids at school, you know, step on a crack, you break your mother's back type of thing. Um, 
So it was kind of like that hop, hopscotch type of game in the in the school that started in school, but it carried over to home and into every place my parents went with me. So uh, I I not only could I not step on the lines, I also the synesthesia. I had to step in the exact same spot of every s square tile, and count as I did it. <laughs> it was like. I counted my chewing, um, I hid my rocking, because my parents were both autistic, but but they didn't, they, they were super, like, negatively, they weren't synesthesia, they were negatively sound sensitive because of, they didn't have synesthesia, and so my rocking would bother them, chewing would bother them, so I, act, I had, to, I was taught to chew quietly, but I also had to make no sound at all when I chewed, whether it was food or ice cubes or carrot sticks, no sound. So I learned to slowly crush. One time I was eating ice, my sister-in-law, and I was like in my 20s. My sister-in-law saw me putting ice in my mouth and it was like 1987. And I'm bite, biting the ice and she sees it's gone. It took her a while to figure out I'm not swallowing the ice. and and. And she saw my jaw go, but no sound. She goes, what do you, how do you eat? I, are, are you biting it? You know, she was asking me about it. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm biting it. And I just crush it and it falls apart between my teeth. And then I just let, like, let it melt in my mouth and, and swallow it. Um, so I had to, with my parents, I had to disguise my rocking so I could rock forward, take, take a bite. And lean back and everything was in rhythms like that so I had synesthesia and and, and autism um, blended pretty pretty well and um, but I drove my dad absolutely crazy with the you know having to be held on hand because I was the kind of kid that uh, I'd be so busy in what I'm doing so absorbed um, exclusively absorbed in what I was doing that I wouldn't notice and bang into somebody he didn't want me to bang into people in the mall and um, so he would be holding my hand and steering me on my wrist so bending my wrist like that and so now I have a damaged wrist from both him and my brother um, my brother was just being vengeful and showing how being in the Navy made him so much stronger than his big sister and squeezed my wrist and I felt that was broken I didn't hear the snap he crushed it so it wasn't like a snap it was a crush but I don't have this band over here anymore the wristband in your wrist it's torn and it hurts all the time but anyway um, yeah that's from being like a, a kid that is in their own little world and there's a lot that goes, there's a lot more to do with the autism. I'm trying to focus mo more on the synesthesia part today. And the synesthesia the is nice. I mean, it helps me really notice like where colors aren't the same values. Like they're not the same hues. They're not, of course, they're not the same dark or light. But they are also like sometimes something is made in such a way that the, the colors are meant to match but I can detect they don't <laughs> and sometimes that's annoying so I don't keep anything like that around and my room is filled with like I do I have all these beautiful things and while this something like this is asymmetric um even like something's put on I put this saying I love um, so it has to go into the symmetric of it and balance it out and there has to be other things placed nearby um, there's just some things that I, I, I really love I, I put my ribbon around I did these for weddings and put this special um, stuff, I'm just, 
that way. I'm a girly girl. And I have butterflies. My room is just filled with hanging butterflies all over. They're literally all over. <laughs> um, and, and cute little creatures, you know, that hang on my little gar garden tr uh, trellis <laughs> and my tree, you know, and my, I had a tree like that one in New York that was, I bought it for a hundred dollars and I had paid like a little at a time to get it and the guy sold it for way less than it was worth but it was gigantic artificial um wisteria tree and i took a butterfly i made butterflies and glued them to the flowers and then i made little bees out of um pipe cleaners but when i came to the wings like i made the wings so realistic that you couldn't tell and i would glue them like hanging on the upside down side of a flower and when people would come over they would say your house looks like a paradise that's what i meant it to look like <laughs> but um yeah so i just did um oh i also um i had gotten a a hummingbird and its feet were made like it was a, cera a ceramic wooden wooden hummingbird i think i got it from the craft store and uh its feet were meant to sit on the edge of a, like a a planter but when you took it upside down it didn't look like it was feet were necessarily doing it and it had its wings out like it was flying so i just took his little nose and glued it up inside of one of the flowers and he was light enough weight that when he hung there, he just looked like a hummingbird getting a drink. And and then one day, on our on our um, above ground pool that I built for my kids, uh, we had monarch butterflies always pass through our our uh, city every year on their way. I think it was to Mexico, and one of them perfectly landed, probably trying to land on a reflection of a tree that was a, was in the vicinity that was probably shining on it and he landed flat so his wings were spread out and died that way so then the, the, that morning when i discovered him i took him out and laid him on a paper towel and he never changed his shape he was just died died like that and dried like that so on the beautiful curtain I had hung, um, I had hand carved the oak finial to expressly hold my curtains out away from our bay window in such a way that gave it more depth. And um, I hung it on the curtain there, which was like this really long, gauzy, s silky, satiny, cottony looking gauze it was like a combination of all of it and draped it was really pretty material um and people would come i had a a beautiful like tropical looking zebra center rug with a floral uh border and outside of that was a um zebra border and you can still find them they're still the same price a hundred dollars <laughs> um but they're very very rare and they're by a certain designer but um yeah it was it was absolutely stunning home that i used to have and all i did, wanted to do was fill it up with flowers and plants and trees and <laughs> make it look as lush as possible and i'm still there i never have i never have been able to get that out of my system I really, I'm the person, I don't want a house. If I had to spend my life on earth forever, I would not want a house. I hear everybody say they would want a house. I would not want a house. I would want a clearing, 
I used to feel that way. I want a clearing. And I wanted a very soft dirt floor in, like I want a long path that comes to my clearing and a, a soft, 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 dark, dark colored dirt floor. And I want a log and something really soft to lay over it for guests, not for me. Because my bed will be the floor and I want to fall asleep on it at night and I want to feel the dirt and the little bits of plant that grows in the clearing sometimes. I want to be close to the ground and I want to smell all of the earthy smell. And if it rained, I wanted it to rain on me and wake up and tell me that it loved me and that I love and I love it too. <laughs> <laughs> and not that rain really talks. I knew that it, it didn't. But I, I wanted to be reminded of God's love when it rained. And and I wanted to feel like beetles that will come out at night and crawl across. And I wanted to be woken up by them so I could see how pretty they were. And think how beautiful the earth is. I wanted a big a leafy plant that would when it when rain would fall or dew would come it would fill the leaf and I would wash my face and that water of the leaf every day if I wanted a drink I could drink from the leaf <laughs> um, and I wanted to be just naked there that's why I wanted a long long stretch with a bell like they would ring a string at one their end and I would hear the bell and it would have an and I know that it was long enough time it would take them to walk like <laughs> at least seven minutes so I could put some clothes and be decent by the time my guests would arrive and I don't want a house I want I would want to see all of that but yeah and that is a is a beautiful hope but I have a far better one now and and love it and um one that appeals to me at least a lot better <laughs> and I won't share it but yeah that's nice um anyway so this is my whole kind of video on the synesthesia and um yeah, some, I don't know what else to say about it. There's probably a lot more will come to my mind after I end this video. Um, there's some things I want to talk about with my autism and how my synesthesia has helped to satisfy those, those wants and um, cravings that I have in autism. And um, I think my synesthesia and autism is extremely well blended and very supportive to one another. It, it's helped me to be very creative. Synesthesia has helped me to be very creative and respond to my autistic needs in, in a very, very satisfying way. And I wish that more autistics could have synesthesia, could be synesthete. Because I don't believe in having something. You don't have autism. You are autistic. So that saying I have autism is like when some people say a wild tiger or a wild alligator. Like, when is a tiger ever not wild? When is... <laughs> When is a giraffe or something ever not wild? Why do you say wild something? It's That's redundant. So saying have autism, but it's not even redundant. It's It just completely doesn't make sense. It's non-grammatical or whatever you call that. You can't have autism. It's impossible. You have a cold because a cold goes away. You have a disease because you need a cure. But you can't have autism. You are autistic or are, I don't even believe in the word autistic, but there's a better word. It's coming in the future. It's coming. 
and definitely it's not something that didn't exist from the dawn of time so yeah that i gotta stop because otherwise i go on another tangent and want to talk about something else and something else because everything is so woven together everything webbed everything links there's nothing in my head that doesn't link from one thing to another if you wanted me to talk about a and z you're gonna have to listen to every letter in between because they're all there they're all connected and there is and there's is not impossible for me to talk about two completely related things and find a way that they are related in my head not at all that's how vast and people don't understand like how complex it's almost like i have a brain with all the synapses and and that's what i live in my synapses i don't live in outside here what i'm doing with my hands i'm always living in my connected synapses that's the only way i can explain it so enjoy your day i'm going to enjoy mine it's a beautiful september sunny day in central usa at about 73 degrees and i'm gonna enjoy my last few days before fall weather comes <laughs> so i'm happy to put these up these videos for people in the beginning of it i wasn't too sure but now i feel great so um i hope you do too